So, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Deborah Lampert Rudman, and I'm the curator of education and public programs at Morven Museum and Garden. You can see it in all its uh, springtime glory behind me there. Uh, but today, um, we're really excited to um, have an evening with renowned historian and author Robert A. Selig. Um, Dr. Selig has created this wonderful program for us, uh, just for Morbin actually, uh, because it's going to have highlights and history surrounding the encampment of Rochambeau's army on the grounds of Morbin between August 29th and 31st, 1781. So we're commemorating the 240th anniversary of this march, as are some of our partner historical societies this month, but we we have it first, we're, we're really excited. And in fact, um, we will have a little question, a little poll for you in a moment um, to see how many really know um, who, how many were at Morbin uh, during that time. So um, without any further ado, I want to introduce you to Dr. Robert Selig. Well, thank you very much, Deb, for uh having me tonight, thank you for the invitation to talk about Rochambeau at Princeton just about exactly 240 years ago, as you, as you mentioned. And let's begin with this first slide. And here he is, our Comte de Rochambeau in all his glory. Um, and if you can see this, the map that is under his uh, left arm, you still just can see the beginnings of the word York, Yorktown, because this is where Rochambeau is going and this is where he's going uh, through Princeton. But when he enters Princeton, he is not alone. Of course, thousands of American forces have preceded him and thousands of French forces are following him as they hasten to Philadelphia to meet up with George, uh, George Washington and the Continental Army which is encamped along the banks of the Schuylkill, uh, right where the 30th Street Station is uh, today off of Market Street. Washington and Rochambeau and their forces are on their way to Yorktown and Princeton is an important and a very well-remembered stop as we shall see on this land and water route that is taken, uh, taking these forces to Yorktown. Now these roads and waterways uh, were designated by Congress and signed into law by President Obama in March 2009 as the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historic Trail or VARO in NPS parlance or W3R for the French group because one of the Frenchmen who was uh, on this committee when this started said, it was not a very nice thing to have Frenchmen say three R's in a row. Now, since not everyone may be familiar with Varro, let me uh, uh, take just a couple of minutes to explain what it is. What is the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route? It is the story of the movements of the Continental Army and of allied forces from New York and Rhode Island to Yorktown between June and September 1781 on water and on land and back north again. In other words, it is not the story of the siege of Yorktown. And if you're looking for any kind of military activity along the route there, there's very, very little uh, that's happening uh, militarily as far as combat is concerned. And this is the story of the march back north again, the Continental Army, in November and December 1781, and French forces in July and August 1782. And just like these forces march through Princeton in 1781, they all march through Princeton again, of course, in, in either December 1781 or in August of seven, and September 9, 1782. It is a route that goes through nine states, and the District of Columbia. And it is the story, this is important, of the contributions of those states to the Allied victory at Yorktown. One of the purposes and goals uh, <clears throat> of this trail 
And here you see the map as they are marching from uh, Newport, Rhode Island, all the way down to Yorktown on water and on land. One of the, one of the goals and purposes of this trail uh, is to show that the American War of Independence is not confined to Lexington, Concord, Valley Forge, and maybe Yorktown. The unifying goals and purposes of these National Historic Trails are to identify resources in the nine states in the District of Columbia along these routes and to assist wherever necessary or wanted in developing a plan to preserve and interpret these resources. Obviously, Morven is one of these uh, resources, one of these sites uh, along this trail, which as we know is, is not only important, but also beautifully preserved and interpreted there. But there are also not only buildings, there are campsites, surviving road sections, and, and architectural landscape features. So if this, this, this first goal and purpose is obviously uh, a prerequisite, because if people ask me, well, what if I want to travel that trail? What is there for me to, to see? And this is where this list of resources comes from. It is also important to note that, uh, that this trail is meant to emphasize the important contributions of the various states and their citizens, right? Is this, this trail goes through nine states, only the Carolinas and Georgia are not part of this trail. Uh, and, and as we shall see, <clears throat> feeding these thousands of men and this, their thousands of animals is only possible because thousands upon thousands of Americans contribute to uh, this march, contribute to the food the wood, the straw, et cetera, for, for this army or these armies as they're marching their way south. It is also uh, uh, meant to point out the diverse regional and cross-cultural intra-American as well as cross-cultural Franco-American experiences. So many Americans had never seen a Frenchman other than during the French and Indian War at the other end of a musket. And this is the first time that Americans really get to meet large numbers of Frenchmen. Uh, it's the first time for the troops from New England, from Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, et cetera, and even from, uh, from uh, Connecticut, uh, New York, the first time that they actually get south of Baltimore, that they get into Maryland, that they get into Virginia, where they see a different culture, which is uh, defined to a large degree by slavery, for example, slavery in a way that they are not familiar with. They are never seen up in New England where they are living. In other words, uh, <clears throat> it is a, this campaign trail and the presence of French forces is a way to find out who you are as an American by knowing what you are not, which is also an, a way of defining yourself. It is meant to show the critical contributions of France to, toward the American independence and the manifestation of the global character of the war. And before the progress, this program started, I was just talking to them about uh, the really the need to have a compilation of, of essays that shows combat theaters all around the world from Gibraltar to India, to Senegal, to uh, Brimstone Hill, to uh, the Jersey Islands. It is truly a global war. If you wanna find out more about the trail, there are two websites. One is the VARO, the NPS website that are put down here. And the other is the website of the, of the French group where you can find all the, the site, the statewide site surveys and resource inventories that I did, including one, of course, for, uh, <clears throat> for New Jersey. Now, having said all of this, let's get Rochambeau to Morven. But why is he going to Morven? What is he doing at Princeton? Why is Rochambeau in America? 
Well, to put it in a nutshell, on the, on the 19th of April, 1775, Massachusetts militiamen had fired on British soldiers at Lexington and Concord, and George III declared the colonists in rebellion and sent troops to try and force them into submission. On the 4th of July, 1776, and it's worth remembering that that is 15 months after Lexington and Concord, uh, we are told that the Second Continental Congress declares the 13 colonies independent, named their country the United States, and the American War of Rebellion turns into the War of Independence from Great Britain. Now, when Congress writes this Declaration of Independence, it begins, or that, and I quote, the history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Who is this candid world that Congress is talking to? It's certainly not King George III ever since Lexington and Concord at the latest. He knows that these colonies want to be independent and has heard all kinds of things about his tyranny. Congress is also not talking to American patriots. Uh, by the 4th of July, uh, nine of the 13 colonies have already declared their independence from Massachusetts, Worcester, Massachusetts in October, 1774, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Rhode Island on the 4th of May, 1776, Virginia on the 16th of May, et cetera, et cetera. It's only New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, they're kind of holdouts. So who is this candid world? Well, this candid world is King Louis XVI of France and to a lesser degree, King Carlos of Spain. Thomas Paine in, Jan in January 1776 had written in, in his Common Sense, everything that is right or natural pleads for separation. It is time to part. Neither fr nothing can settle our affairs so ex expeditiously as an open and determined declaration for independence because neither France nor Spain will give us any kind of assistance while we profess ourselves the subjects of Great Britain. So in other words, the Declaration of Independence is a list of grievances to attempt to justify the rebellion, but it also has an integral foreign policy component that is often forgotten. And it is a plea for assistance from France and Spain for money, guns, cannon, clothing, experts, you name it. <clears throat> now we know that the Battle of Bunker Hill is in 17 June 1775, the war is on, and France commits herself very early on when she begins to provide substantial financial and material support in early 1777 already. The Amphitrite, the first French vessels with supplies sails on the 25th of January, 1777, and arrives in Portsmouth in New Hampshire on the 20th of April. Of April. And the material that she brings, including artillery pieces, go straight over to, uh, to Gates and are of crucial and vital importance for the Battle of Saratoga. France then in February 1778 signs treaties of amity and friendship and a secret treaty of military alliance. So I said February 1778, but we all know the war in 1779 doesn't go too well down in, in Savannah, Charleston, then the, the New Jersey and Pennsylvania lines, mutiny in January 1780. And so the decision in January 1780, on the part of King Louis the 16th to send ground forces under the command of the Comte de Rochambeau is what <clears throat> the background why we have French forces here. It has nothing to do with 
uh, the king of France suddenly thinking that all men are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights. The French king of France uh, is, knows he's playing with fire uh, uh, and nevertheless decides to assist uh, these rebels against uh, the king of England because the king of England uh, or, or Great Britain is the traditional enemy in a way, so to speak. And so uh, Rochambeau with his forces leaves on a fleet that is commanded by the Chevalier de Tarnay uh, and lands in Newport in Rhode Island on the 11th of July, 1780. Besides a crew of about 7,000 sailors, this fleet uh, carries the troops of the Expedition Particulière, about 450 officers and 5,000 men. Here's a breakdown uh, from the uh, summer of 1780 with, uh, with uh, troop numbers, regimental numbers, etc. What is important is that Rosenbaum has about 5,000 men under his, under his uh, command. They are the sailors five, six, seven thousand sailors is hard to say. Either way, the population of Newport triples when French forces get there. The, the issues feeding these men uh, for months would be a, an interesting talk in itself. The troops spent the winter of 1780-81 in Newport and in Lebanon, Connecticut which the Duc de Lausanne compares with Siberia. And then at Weathersfield in Connecticut in May of 1781, the two generals decide to join their forces outside New York City for a siege of the center of British power. The destination, the target, the plan for the campaign of 1781 is the siege and capture of New York City for a number of reasons, primarily, however, because New York City is the center of British power in the United States. These forces leave from Providence on the 18th of June. Uh, Washington's forces leave, leave on the 10th of June from Newburgh and join up at White Plains and unite at White Plains on the 6th of July, 1781. And for those of you who are familiar with this area a little bit, uh, there's White Plains, uh, the town of Greenberg, uh, actually, uh, and the French French forces are here uh, on the Sunningdale Country Club on Underhill Road. Rochambeau's headquarters is still standing up there. It's currently in the process of being renovated. Uh, and Continental Army forces over here near Ardsley uh, High School Washington's headquarters up there where it says Ferncliff Cemetery is uh, no longer standing. And see, so here they are, the Continental Army, approximately, as you see at the bottom, approximately 6,000 men strong in you know, more, about two dozen regiments, French forces, about 4,400 uh, men strong. The combined strength, as it says here, of the Allied armies in Greenberg, living in an encampment that springs up overnight, I mean, literally, is smaller than that of British forces under the command of Sir Henry Clinton. This, what, 10,000, 11,000 people with camp followers and cattle, etc., literally starts laying out a camp. There are no porta potties there are no no uh, whatever the the little stores you have out there where you get your stuff there's no Kroger's there's no Myers there's no Sam's Club there's no nothing out there the the it's hard for us to imagine that the sanitary conditions if nothing else but I think when uh, General Green once said you can always tell the location of an army camp by the cloud of black flies hovering over it that probably comes pretty close for July and August of 1781, and 1780 rather. Just, just for comparative purposes, I mean, we have, have 10, 12,000 Cornell Army forces. 
How large is Philadelphia? How large is Boston? Philadelphia, 34,000 with highly fluctuating population. New York City is 24,000, Boston 16, Charleston. In other words, this camp, this United camp that's up there in, in the town of Greenberg is the fifth largest city in the United States. Wilmington, Delaware, for example, about 1,200 inhabitants, fewer people than the crew of Admiral de Grasse's flag, flagship. Princeton has less than 500. Compared to London, right, 800,000 people. Paris, 600,000 people. And there we have Philadelphia hovering around 30,000, population of around 30,000. Like I said, now the plan, keep these numbers in mind because when we get to the march through uh, New Jersey and through Princeton, when you have, what, what I say, 10,000 people marching through and there's a population of 500 uh, there to, to welcome them. We'll see that this must have been like a, a herd of locusts descending on the countryside there. But as I said, the plan for the 1781 campaign had been to lay siege to New York City, but this siege can only be successful, will only be successful if there is a fleet to complete the siege ring on water around New York City. The Allied armies are there on the 6th of July and they are waiting for De Grasse, Admiral De Grasse, who said he would be there on the 15th of July, but it doesn't show up and it doesn't show up until on, finally, on the 14th of August, Rochambeau receives a letter from Admiral De Grasse that he is sailing to the Chesapeake Bay rather than to New York City. And so Washington and Rochambeau quickly shift gears and on the 18th of August, the two armies are on their way. 4,000 French, about 2,300 Continental Army and enlisted men make it 6,600. But that's, of course, that's not all. There are about French officers, about 425 wagoners, a long wagon train for the French and a much smaller wagon train for the Americans, mostly because of the Continental Army Washington doesn't have the money to pay any of the wagoners. About a thousand servants for French officers. I still have to meet a French officer, even a lowly second lieutenant, who doesn't travel with at least two servants, which adds another whole complete infantry regiment to the Continental Army, uh, to the French Army, about 50 to 60 American women, another 30. In other words, the fifth largest city in the United States is on its way. And if you're wondering why the Continental Army is so small, you know, a little more than half the size of the French Army, that's simply because Washington has to leave the majority of his forces behind to keep an eye on Sir Henry Clinton in, the, in, uh, in New York City. Here's a drawing of the Continental Army that I want to show you because I think it reflects the diversity of the Continental Army in 1781. It's white and black. It's uh, free and it's enslaved. It's Protestant and Catholic. The Canadian regiment has a large number of Catholic Frenchmen. It's also multilingual because the, the language of command of the Canadian regiment, a large number of them speak French and parts of the orderly book are in French. And while the Continental Army also has a German regiment from Maryland, where the language of command is German. So it's a wide, uh, it's really reflective of, of, the, of the diversity of the United States at its birth in 1781. I also want to show you a couple, just quickly, uh, some drawings, contemporary drawings of so French forces, uh, the in Infantry regiments, here you see the Royal de Bon in blue. That's the Wittelsbach blue because the, the proprietor of the, of the regiment is from the House of Wittelsbach, the future kings of Bavaria. Here's the artillery uh, in here. And finally, Lausanne's legions of Hussars. 
<coughs> 300 hussars and 300 men, infantry and artillery. These are the forces that will set out on the 14th of August on their way to Yorktown. As I said, on the 14th of August, Washington and Rochambeau learn in a letter that the grass is going to Chesapeake. They'll stay until the 15th of October. Uh, that's 62 days or 58 days uh, since the departure on the 18th of August. The speed with which this wagon train now is moving is 10 to 12 miles per day. As they set out, Washington is very much aware of the fact that his estimated time of arrival will be around the 6th, 7th, maybe 8th of October. It's going to, if Admiral de Grasse really leaves on the 15th of October, he has less than 10 days to lay siege to Cornwallis and force him to surrender. There is a certain time element, as you will understand now, behind this raid. This, raid. this by the way, these, these uh, images are of the Odell House, which was Washington's uh, Rochambeau's headquarters, excuse me, and it's looking much better already uh, compared to these images here, because there's a friends group, friends of the Odell House, that is working very hard, hard with the state of New York to restore this and make this into a uh, uh, like a house museum almost and a and a uh, information point on this Washington uh, Rochambeau revolutionary route, and so these forces are now marching, uh, crossing the Hudson and marching into New Jersey, and I just want to see show you a couple uh, real quick some some maps to show you the progression of of uh, these forces, the 20th of August, the 21st of August, uh, the 22nd of August, the 23rd of August. All we see here is this is time that the Allied armies need to cross the Hudson at Stony Point, uh, march uh, across, New, across New York here and get into New Jersey. But there's one there's one detachment of about 600 troops here at, at uh, Springfield that is way ahead of the rest. Why is that? And which is 600 troops out of 2,400, that's, uh, that's a quarter of the whole Continental Army that's on the route. Well, that's because in June of 1780 already, uh, Kniphausen had raided Springfield and Chatham. This Springfield, if Sir Henry Clinton wants to do anything to stop this march across New Jersey, Springfield coming from New York into Springfield, Chatham, up to Morristown, that is the moment, the only time that he can stop uh, this march into New, in, across New Jersey to Philadelphia. Now, slowly, we see other forces entering New Jersey and spreading out. Spreading out has is there is done for a number of reasons, uh, obviously, having to do with the fact that these thousands of men and animals will need to be fed, having to do with the fact that the roads are not laid out for so many uh, wagons and animals, and having to do uh, with the fact that when you spread them out, you, you can move much faster over a number of Routes and I think it becomes very clear. But what it also very clear is French forces, the largest columns, are farthest inside as they march across New Jersey until they get to Springfield and Chatham, Hanover, uh, Whippany, because this is the uh, last potential area of deployment for a possible attack by against Sir Henry Clinton in New York City. Once these forces depart for Princeton the next day, Washington and Rochambeau have committed themselves irrevocably to a campaign against Lord Cornwallis. This is wh where they are standing on the 28th of July, as they keep on now moving still on three in three columns from, from Chatham down to, uh, to Princeton, because as we get to Princeton, as we get to Trenton, 
you see how all of these columns merge again. Uh, <clears throat> because now we have, once you get to river crossings, that's always a, a bottleneck. And, and Princeton and Trenton is one of those river crossings, is one of those bottlenecks uh, that will get you uh, uh, into Philadelphia and then farther south. Uh, many of you will have seen or know this, uh, this tablet on the Millstone River, uh, uh, identifying the crossing here. Uh, here is the, the 18th century road along the, the river here, uh, which is still there, the Red Horse Tavern, the Black Horse Tavern, they're all still standing, the Kingston route, and then we get into Trent, into uh, Princeton. But I've been talking about these thousands of animals and people. Uh, on the road to New Jersey here, uh, there are what, 195 teams with, with uh, 1,100 draft oxen, 110 private wagons, Continental Army, 800 oxen that we know were slaughtered in Baltimore. So we get uh, uh, in August and September 1781, around 8,500 people and 4,500 large animals approaching Princeton and walking to Princeton because as I think the map showed this at Princeton, but by the time they get to Princeton, all the allied armies have all converged onto a single road. These and the population of Princeton, right, is less than 500 people. These columns are, miles upon miles long, three miles probably more, because you all know when you're in a parade, when you first set out, everything is fine. And after a while, you're either standing or running to catch up. How fast do they move? A mile and a half per hour, 12 miles a day. You can make a horse gallop, but you cannot get an oxen gallop. And while these oxen animals also have to be fed, of course, uh, they also leave things behind that you need to keep in mind. You know, I just approximate approximation, something like a thousand gallons of animal, just urine, liquid waste per mile. Uh, now you know why the wagons are, the animals at the end of the column, not at the front, because I sure wouldn't want to uh, march uh, after these thousands of animals uh, that are going that we see here. Looking at the number of inhabitants of the towns that they're marching through, I think it should be very obvious that a town like Princeton is in no position to feed even a fraction of these thousands of men and animals that are marching through over the course of three or four days, the Continental Army first. And this is what I meant when I said this campaign, this march, is or can only be successful if people in the countryside uh, for miles around, dozens of miles around, contribute, not for free, but contribute, sell their goods, pref preferably to the French, because the French pay in gold and silver, which leads to uh, uh, numbers, quite some friction with Americans, because as one American quartermaster once said, uh, you are living in luxury while the Continental Army is starving. On the other hand, uh, soldiers in a Continental Army by now are pretty much used to starving, unfortunately. So these, these stories that you read in 19th century books that the, that the women of Somerset Courthouse uh, fired up their ovens and baked apple pies because we're in August for the soldiers as they marched through sound beautiful, but uh, how many apple pies do you have to bake for 8,000 people on very short notice? Keeping in mind, of course, that any supply, any supply that goes to these armies moves at the same speed as the armies are moving. The oxen with the supplies for the armies move no faster than the oxen of the armies uh, themselves. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to set up uh, uh, supply depots along the route uh, because there's also a component 
of uh, of secrecy that Washington wants to maintain to keep Sir Henry Clinton in the dark about the true destination of these armies uh, as they're marching across as they're marching across New Jersey until they eventually uh, arrive at Princeton. This is a map from a, a, a journal that's out at the Huntington Library in, uh, in uh, California. Uh, you see Marvin obviously on the left-hand side and the college uh, on the, on the right-hand side. You're probably more familiar with this drawing uh, by, by Louis-Alexandre de Berthier, uh, much more uh, detailed uh, drawing of the encampment at Princeton. The original is in the Firestone Library over at, at Princeton, if you want to see it. And he is very clear the Morvan is, uh, uh, where the encampment of the armies is clear across. You see the little artillery pieces. The red is the artillery. The uh, uh, yellow uh, uh, squares uh, are infantry. The college is uh, identified the streets that are coming in the route and the route to Trenton. And so let's, let's uh, stop here for a minute and, and look what, the, uh, uh, what some of the French officers wrote about uh, New Jersey and Princeton. The Abbé Robin, in his travels through North America, writes under Princeton 1 September 1781 that New Jersey is wholly different from the country we have hitherto traversed. It is not like Connecticut covered with small hills lying close together, which rendered traveling difficult. Uh, many ridges of mountains, which seem to be branches of the Appalachian, stretch from northeast to southwest and form intervals of vast and beautiful plains. Uh, the uh, hot no, Hachang Mountains, what's it called? Wachang Mountains, for example, is what he's talking about. A plains which, which the hand of the geometrician seems to have smoothed to a level. These plains are adorned with large and handsome edifices, and the country abounds with orchards, fields of wheat, rye, barley, Indian corn, and flourishing woods. He's talking about New Jersey. The inhabitants, for the most part of Alsatian and Dutch descent, are gay, easy, and engaging in their manners and resemble the happy region they inhabit. You will often see the women decked with their headdresses and gauzes, riding in their farm wagons to market, drawn by the most elegant horses. And he waxes and wanes like this, and this is the description of New Jersey that's quite at odds from what we usually read about a country devastated by war, by years of war, by British forces marching all the way down to Trenton and back, Morristown, etc. Baron Closen is an aide de camp to Rochambeau, writes The Jersey, where we now are, is a beautiful country abounds in all kinds of produce. The inhabitants who are of Dutch origins have kept it neat and have retained their gentle and peaceful customs, have been very friendly toward the army. It is a land of milk and honey with game, fish, vegetables, poultry, etc. After leaving New York State, where misery is written on the brows of the inhabitants, that's because New York is a high tax state, I think. After leaving New York State, where misery is written on the brows of the inhabitants, the affluence in the state of New Jersey seems to be much greater. Axel von Fersen writes similarly, Gromot Dubois writes, writes, this is an open and well cultivated country, quite rich. We arrived in good season and the camps being set and the troops arrive. I thought I could do no better than go to Totova to see a cataract, which is considered to be the most curious sight in all parts of the country. Here's another uh, aspect that we have when we look at the accounts by French officers. The aides de camp and officers above company grade have time and they use this 
journeys all up and down the East Coast as like an as an educational opportunity to learn the countryside. They don't miss a battleground. Every French officer at his time writes about the Battle of Princeton and what he sees and what he hears about the Battle of Princeton and uh, accounts of the experience of, of experiences of enlisted men are extremely rare. There are only three known accounts by enlisted, uh, by enlisted men. One of them is André Amblard of the saint Ange, who writes, the fertility and beauty of that province causes it to be called the Garden of America. It is that part inhabited by the Dutch and Germans. Maybe that's where the nomic, moniker, the Garden State, comes from. You heard it here first from André Amblard. Uh, as they are marching uh, through, uh, through Princeton, uh, there's a second account by an enlisted man, and this is by George Daniel Floor, uh, which is in German. And uh, it's full of these little folk art, little drawings. And one of them is, is uh, New Jersey. You see uh, uh, Frankfurt, then up top right is Moritztown, a little, then comes Somerset, and finally Princeton. And he drew uh, the college or Princeton University here uh, uh, in there uh, as well. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to finish my translation and publication. I'll get this, get this published. Uh, what what uh, Floor has to say. Uh, here is, uh, so you see an example of some of the handwriting you have to deal with, uh, dealing with uh, French primary sources. This is by, by Los de Bayac, uh, Lieutenant Colonel of the saint Ange Regiment, talking about Princeton, a pretty village, well built, number of inhabitants is very diminished. We camped on the battlefield as a college in the village, a pretty building built in 1750. Actually, it was built in 1756 uh, uh, through a conscription. The interior was completely destroyed by the English. One sees here a planetary machine in copper, similar to the one that is in Philadelphia. What is he writing about? Because he, like a number of of other uh, officers that march through Princeton mention uh, this planetary machine that is an absolute must see when you are in Princeton. The Conde de Clermont Coeur, for example, an artillery officer writes that Princeton is well built and pleasantly situated. There's a very handsome college here which possesses some most interesting physics apparatus, including a clock that marks the passage of time in months and years, as well as the revolutions of the moon, of the earth around the sun, of this orbit from tropic to tropic, and the course of the seven planets. This instrument, which is more like a ter terrestrial and celestial globe than a clock, seems most ingenious. And the Abbe Robin uh, similarly uh, describes this, this mechanism. Well, what is this mechanism? This mechanism is the orrery built by David Rittenhouse in 1771 for the College of New Jersey. Uh, if you want to see it, it's still on display in William Charles Payton Hall at Princeton University. And a couple of years ago, more than 10 years ago, when I gave a talk at Princeton, a uh, faculty member was in the audience and we talked about it afterwards and he sent me this picture and there was three computers apart and I don't remember, I don't have to email anymore from him, but if the gentleman is uh, in the audience, I thank him very much. I've used this, your image uh, on numerous occasions. So this orrery, it's called an orrery, is a mechanical model of the solar system invented circa 1700 by George Graham. And it received its name uh, from the English instrument maker, John Rawley, who made a copy 
in honor of Charles Boyle, the Earl of Orrery. That's where the name comes from. And Rittenhouse built a similar one for the College of Philadelphia or University of Pennsylvania. And that's in the Van Pelt Library at the University of Pennsylvania. There are only two of those. Now, these armies are now across New Jersey. And they're in Princeton. And they know they got away from Sir Henry Clinton. And now it's time to celebrate. And one of the uh, primary sources I want to show you is from the Wattsworth Papers and the, and the Hartford in the, in the Connecticut Historical Society at Hartford, uh, uh, kept by Jacob Bergen, who kept the tavern called the Sign of the 13 Stars, also known as the Sign of the Confederation. And as you look at these, the bill, and it goes on for pages, and September 1st, this is when French forces get there, it is mostly rocks, sherry, wine, some suppers, uh, but then a bowl of sherry, that's lodging their pitchers, and then two and a half gills of gin and sherry, breakfast, but right after breakfast, we get punch, brandy, more punch, rock, bottles of wine, uh, they, they, they were certainly well oiled as they made their uh, march across New Jersey. But believe me, those were more than welcome guests in a, in, a, in a state and in a city that had suffered greatly on the, on the British occupation uh, in a state that was cash starved uh, with nothing but continental, continental dollars uh, to, uh, as, as a currency. <clears throat> After lodging in Florida, in uh, uh, Princeton, and I'm sorry to say, in the like three dozen accounts uh, of of uh, Princeton in French diaries, uh, uh, and I just gave you a sampling of it. Not one of them talks about Morven, unfortunately, or mentions the place. Uh, but after, uh, otherwise, it would have quoted it. Uh, after their two-day stay in, uh, in Princeton, they march out of Princeton, uh, past the Princeton battlefield. There's a number of, of uh, counts of the Battle of Princeton across the Stony Brook Creek here. Uh, and you're all familiar, obviously, uh, with, this, uh, with the countryside here, go uh, Stony Brook Creek, and then on toward Trenton, where they cross the... Uh, where they cross uh, the Delaware River over into Pennsylvania. Here's a, a, a drawing, actually, a survey map from the 31st of March. You can see this right above the, the Trent House uh, that I wanted to show you because uh, it shows the, the new ferry that they will be using uh, the French forces and the Continental Army to as well to cross the Delaware River. Uh, here is Berkey's map. Uh, it shows the barracks, uh, which is still standing, obviously. Uh, it shows the Trent House, uh, where the uh, French forces here encamped on the grounds of the Trent House. It shows the ferry over uh, across the river. And the ferry house, uh, which is at the top right hand of this slide, is also still standing. So between the barracks, the Trent House, and the ferry house, uh, uh, not that much has changed other than there's now a, you know, a modern bridge. I don't know if it still says Trenton makes and the world takes. Uh, last time I was there, that's what it said. Talking about uh, Trenton, uh, Trenton is really the moment where allied forces, where Washington can breathe a little early, easier, because in two weeks, the combined armies have disengaged from New York City, marched across New Jersey, and reached Philadelphia. It's the most dangerous part of the journey to Yorktown because it is at, at Springfield, Chatham, in the neighborhood that Sir Henry Clinton really could have stopped this march, interfered, thrown off the whole timetable. A timetable that we know was very, very tight. Uh, uh, knowing that the grass will only stay till the 15th of, of October. Well, we know that uh, he, he uh, 
uh, adds another two weeks to that, uh, fortunately, and the siege of Yorktown is successful and Sir uh, and Lord, Lord Cornwallis is forced to surrender on the 19th of October, 1781. They're marching through Philadelphia uh, and it's nothing like this wonderful 19th century painting because as Thacker says, the streets being extremely dirty and the weather warm and dry, we raise the dust like a smothering snowstorm, blinding our eyes and covering our bodies. This is what the march of these thousands of men, this, this column of thousands of animals across New Jersey and through Princeton most likely was like, uh, with the big difference that in Princeton, the streets were probably not dirty and much cleaner than in Philadelphia. Uh, they reach Yorktown, as I said, and force the surrender of Lord Cornwallis on the 19th of October, 1781. And this is a painting by uh, Don Troiani, one of the probably the premier painter of the War of Independence, who has a big exhibit of his paintings opening up in uh, Philadelphia at the museum in October of this year. The, uh, the bulldog at the bottom is historically correct in case you were wondering. Trenton, as I said, is the, the place where Washington can finally breathe a little easier. And so I think it's appropriate, and it's very nice that uh, in on the 28th of August, I mean, almost to the day when Washington can start to breathe a little easier is the celebration at the William Trent House Museum uh, with American French infantry, artillery, and actors, etc. Uh, and I encourage all of you, uh, those of you who are closer to Trenton than I am, as I live in West Michigan, to maybe spend some time there and learn something in addition or to what you may have learned from what I said today, what I tried to tell you today about the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route through the state of New Jersey and about Rochambeau at Princeton. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Selig. This was just so wonderful. Um, we do have a question in the um, chat and please, if you were thinking of some, now is the time to, you can either put them in the Q&A or in the chat, but one we have here, if you can uh, go back to the, um, slide, I don't know if you can or if you can just know it, the slide that had floors drawing. And there's a question that to the bottom left of yeah. his drawing, could that possibly be Morvin? Uh, right, yeah, that could be. There's a house, a little bluish kind of. Yeah, well, it's, it's actually the whitish house and it is kind of a oh, position the down the way um, from, you know, on the bottom left. Yeah, yeah, it could well be because he does set it aside from uh, from the town itself. Right, and also um, the way it's shaped and the big tree, it looks, uh, I think there could be. Um, but is there any way to find out if it is? Is that part of your research coming up because you were gonna uh, translate this? Oh, I have it translated, I just the books don't really pay your taxes and your and your your food uh uh i'll have to go back to what he has to say about uh about uh princeton and the march here i mean the houses themselves are as he sees them floor is born 1756 so he's 24 years old so 25 years old when he marches through here he actually ends his day down in withwell in virginia but some of the uh uh, some of the information that's on there when I check them, uh, he has a beautiful drawing of, of uh, Williamsburg, for example, is quite correct historically. Uh, I'll make it, I'll make the, the slide a little larger. And if you would like, I can be glad to send you one, uh, an image of that. Well, thank but you. As, yeah, but you know Morven and the shape, et cetera, of it better than I do. Right. And it, and it does look different from, from all the other little houses, doesn't it? Right, and it was a pretty prominent house at the time. Um, mm -hmm. 
So thank you for looking into that. I, another question we have here, is there any evidence that the column was discovered by the British? Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, Sir Henry Clinton has a, uh, a very well working spy system uh, created and, and built up by a man named Andre, uh, who is, as you well know, is a hanged then. Uh, Sir Henry Clinton knew within 24 hours, if not less, where French and American forces were and what they were doing. I mean, Sir Henry Clinton knew uh, by the 20th of August, he knew that the Colonel Army was, uh, was crossing, had, had begun to cross uh, at Stony Point. Uh, he, uh, by the 23rd or 24th of August, there are the first uh, intelligence reports that say uh, uh, that these forces are on the way to Philadelphia and they will go to Yorktown to try and get Lord Cornwallis. Uh, he has a very good intelligence uh, operation, which, all, uh, which, tell, which tells him that, uh, that uh, the Vicomte de Rochambeau, Rochambeau's son, has a girlfriend whom he sent ahead to Trenton, uh, which his father didn't know he had a girlfriend. But Sir Henry Clinton did, and if you are going to uh, to Le Siege in New York City, coming from Springfield, Chatham, you're not going to send your girlfriend to Trenton to wait for you. In other words, Sir Henry Clinton knew everything that Washington knew, and very often he knew it before Washington knew. Sir Henry Clinton knew on the 3rd of September that Admiral de Grasse had arrived in the Chesapeake. Washington and Rochambeau found out on the 5th only. Wow. Um, I have several more questions here. Um, what museum is the display of paintings going to occur in Philadelphia in October? It's the Museum of the American Revolution. Uh, They're the new one. And Troiani, I think, is going to show 40 of his original paintings of the War of Independence. Uh, and is all the originals because he told me it was not that easy to get the owners to loan their, their originals for an extended period of time. There's also a beautiful uh, catalog that goes along with the exhibition that will be available uh, then. And it's, I think it opens on the 16th of October, thereabouts, so, or 17th, somewhere around there. Thank you. Um, another question, did Floor, see people like this young artist, did Floor draw Trenton? Uh, probably, I don't, I, I, uh, I don't recall now whether they did or not, uh, but probably this, his journal has 26 different uh, drawings in them. So uh, it's quite, it's quite uh, possible that floor has it, uh, but I can't, uh, uh, I can't really uh, tell you now whether he does or not. Uh, Dumfries, Hanover, uh, do, you, do you see? Uh, yeah, here we go. Yes, he does. Uh, he shows Trenton. Let me see if I can uh, share this uh, with you or not. Uh, if I pull this, yeah. Uh, can you see this? No, probably not. He, okay. Yes, he does. Pardon? That's, the same, that's the same slide you had up. Yeah. No, I just, I just, uh, is it now? It's still the same yes, slide, Yes, that's right? it. That's it. No, no, that's the Trenton one, I think. Yeah, that's Trenton. Yeah, okay. You see Trenton. It says a beautiful village in a province of New Jersey. Then it said the Fruits Delaware, the Delaware River. On the other side is Bristol. And the, the Bristol... Bristol of all the Bristol uh, forest here, and then the area of Indian field up uh, top left. Love this, beautiful. Yeah, like I said, and he has 26, I think of those in color uh, uh, in there, but in, that includes in Jamaica, uh, where he's taking a prisoner at some point, he's in Jamaica on the way back, etc. And when did you say he, did you say he died on this? Yeah, no, uh, after, after uh, the campaign is over, he sails uh, with his regiment, the Royal Dipole Regiment, back to France. 
uh, is discharged then in 1786, goes to his hometown, where uh, actually goes to Strasbourg and starts uh, writing his journal and making these drawings. He must have worked from notes, I imagine, because these drawings are right where they belong in the text. Then in a, in a brief account, he's apparently in Paris and sees the execution of the king in 1791, uh, 92, I forget now. And that's when he decides it's time to get out of the old world comes back to the United States, lands in Baltimore, uh, becomes a Lutheran minister and ends his days in the, uh, as a Lutheran minister in Withwheel in westernmost uh, Virginia, where his baptismal records are there. And while he is there, he draws some of those little, these uh, baptismal certificates that their Germans, 18th century Germans have so many of them. Hmm. So his, grave is, his grave is there. If you ever get to this cemetery in Withwell, you'll recognize it immediately because it has a headstone and a footstone. And his wife's buried right next to him, but only with a headstone, no footstone. Well, interesting. Um, another, we have quite a few questions here. I want to get to them before too long. Um, where did they get the boats to cross the Hudson, the Delaware, and other rivers? Uh, the crossing the, the Hudson, both at, at uh, Dobbs Ferry, as well at Stony Point, uh, those are Continental Army uh, boats. There's a boat service on the Hudson that takes uh, the men across the, uh, the oxen, the cattle uh, uh, is required to just swim across the Hudson at Stony Point, which is quite, which is quite a distance, obviously. And really surprises the French when watching the so just let them sw swim across, they'll do. Uh, uh, smaller uh, rivers like the Neshaminy, for example, there's a rope ferry there that they are taking. Uh, when it, uh, in the Schuylkill in Philadelphia, there's a bridge, a floating bridge that they can all take. We know that they took them because they have the ferry bill, uh, What how much they paid. Uh, the Delaware, uh, there's the ferry uh, for uh, for the men, and then there's a ford. What is on the uh, on the uh, 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 on the map there that I have that I showed here? You see this uh, the ford way, and this is where the animals uh, walked across. Uh, if it's not possible, like farther south, when you get to the Susquehanna, then they or the Potomac in uh, Washington, D.C., then they simply march upstream until they get the river gets shallower and they can, uh, can cross there. Uh, that's how they uh, get across. Interesting question here. Uh, did Washington and Rochambeau actually have dinner at Morven with Annis Stockton on August 29th, or is that just a good story? Uh, I think that's just a good story. Uh, the, the problem is uh, Rochambeau's uh, memoirs say very little. Uh, the whole march across New Jersey is like three sentences. That's all there in it. You know, this, uh, and, and uh, uh, Washington's diary, I don't recall seeing anything uh, about that, uh, but I can check that, uh, check that again. The thing is, uh, they are all anxious to get to uh, to Williamsburg, to Yorktown, because you see how tight the schedule was, and they knew they had to spend some time in Philadelphia to meet with Congress, to meet with the French and Spanish ambassadors, et cetera, et cetera. So they spend a couple of days in Philadelphia, but both Washington as well as Rochambeau ride way ahead by a couple of days of their armies to do their to do the rounds of the congressmen uh, and ambassadors, et cetera, that they know that they have have to take. So uh, Rosenbaum, to the best of my knowledge, simply rode through because we know that from uh, the Comte de Lobedier, uh, one of his aides de camp, they just don't even stop because then Philadelphia, with all due respect, 
being the seat of government is just so much more important. And and um, just two more, and that's we will go. But how do you explain Clinton's inactivity? Why didn't he try to stop Washington and Rochambeau? That is one of the big uh, questions and quandaries of the of the War of Independence. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I showed the troop numbers. Clinton certainly has the troops, the strength of forces to uh, to at least block, to try and block the road. Getting over to Springfield or Chatham is not that difficult. It had been done before in, seven, in the summer of 1780. Uh, it has to do, uh, I think, with a lot with, with Clinton's uh, mental state. Clinton had been trying to... Uh, resign his command a couple of times and had always been turned bound by George III. His heart wasn't in this war uh, anymore and he was already writing his, uh, his explanation as to why uh, the war was lost and that it was not his fault. Uh, I talked the other day to uh, Todd Bracelet at the conference and he said, if you look at the minutes of the meetings of the, uh, of the staff, uh, of Clinton and his staff, uh, it's always, okay, October 1st, what are we going to do? I don't know. Uh, let's meet again tomorrow. This is how this had been. This, uh, like frozen. The British command is almost frozen. And uh, uh, that, that pervaded apparently the whole British staff, including the, including the Navy. Uh, Admiral Hood, after the Battle of the Capes on the 5th of September, writes a letter to Clinton and says, well, we lost, but I hope at least we did our duty. Uh, okay, we did our duty and, you know, that's all we could do. That's kind of the, the mood, apparently, that they're in. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I, I don't believe we have any more questions, but I do have to say this was so fascinating and so colorful. Um, you really did bring so much of this to life. Um, and I'm going to do a quick promo for our friends at the Trent House um, because uh, Sam Stevens is on with us tonight and he's telling us that the reenactor groups participating at the Trent House event on August 28th include those representing Le Regiment Bourbonnet, Le Regiment, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, Santong. First Rhode Island, the Black Regiment, and the Second Continental Lambs Artillery Regiment. The old barracks interpreters will also participate, and there will be representatives of the Crossroads of the American Revolution and the National and New Jersey Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route Association. So if this tonight has whet your appetite for more, uh, August 28th, be sure to um, be at the Trent House for their program. But... Thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Selig. Really, really wonderful um, program. And uh, we hope you do get to come visit Morvin in person from your, from your perch in the Midwest. And um, thank you all again. And you'll be getting this uh, as a recording later this evening. And if I may uh, say something too, I thank you very much for uh, having given me the opportunity to uh, to do this, I too hope that there will come a point when I can actually see you in person and not like a little square on my computer screen. And if you have any questions that you think I can help you with, uh, my email address is Robert A. Selig, all one word, Robert A. Selig, all one word, at gmail.com. So feel I have free. added that to the chat. And so we have it right there. And I'll I'll uh, try and help you uh, and answer your questions if uh, if you should have any. I'm sure there are some. But thank you very much for having me. And thank you very much for okay. wasting a good hour of your time. No, it was me. wonderful, truly wonderful. Thank you so much again. There are a lot of kudos coming in to me directly, but I'm going to share them with you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everyone.